Angel is saying to you, Belief in God means believing that there is a God. This is the simplest concept as regards believing in God. What's more, believing that there is a God is not the same as truly believing in God. Rather, it is a kind of simple faith with strong religious overtones. True faith in God means the following. On the basis of the belief that God holds sovereignty over all things, one experiences his words and his work, purges one's corrupt disposition, satisfies the will of God, and comes to know God. Only a journey of this kind may be called faith in God. I thank you that you are Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there. You are with me, even in the midst of my most difficult circumstances. I thank you that you will never give up on me. Help me to remain in you and to abide in your presence each day. Amen. He who is God incarnate shall possess the essence of God, and he who is God incarnate shall possess the expression of God. Since God becomes flesh, he shall bring forth the work he intends to do, and since God becomes flesh, he shall express what he is, and shall be able to bring the truth to man, bestow life upon him, and point the way for him. Flesh that does not have the essence of God is decidedly not the incarnate God. Of this there is no doubt. If man intends to inquire into whether it is God's incarnate flesh, then he must corroborate this from the disposition he expresses and the words he speaks, which is to say, to corroborate whether or not it is God's incarnate flesh, and whether or not it is the true way, one must discriminate on the basis of his essence. And so, in determining whether it is the flesh of God incarnate, the key lies in his essence, his work, his utterances, his disposition, and many other aspects, rather than external appearance. If man scrutinizes only his external appearance, and as a result overlooks his essence, this shows that man is benighted and ignorant. Since man believes in God, he must closely follow the footsteps of God, step by step. He should follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Only these are the people who seek the true way. Only they are the ones who know the work of the Holy Spirit. People who slavishly follow letters and doctrines are those who have been eliminated by the work of the Holy Spirit. In each period of time, God will begin new work, and in each period, there will be a new beginning among man. If man only abides by the truths that Jehovah is God and Jesus is Christ, which are truths that only apply to their respective ages, then man will never keep up with the work of the Holy Spirit and will forever be incapable of gaining the work of the Holy Spirit. Regardless of how God works, man follows without the slightest doubt, and he follows closely. In this way, how could man be eliminated by the Holy Spirit? Regardless of what God does, as long as man is certain that it is the work of the Holy Spirit, and cooperates in the work of the Holy Spirit without any misgivings, and tries to meet the requirements of God, then how could he be punished? The return of Jesus is a great salvation for those who are capable of accepting the truth, but for those who are unable to accept the truth it is a sign of condemnation. You should choose your own path, and should not blaspheme against the Holy Spirit and reject the truth. You should not be an ignorant and arrogant person, but someone who obeys the guidance of the Holy Spirit and longs for and seeks the truth. Only in this way will you benefit. I advise you to tread the path of belief in God with care. Do not jump to conclusions. What is more, do not be casual and thoughtless in your belief in God. You should know that, at the very least, those who believe in God should be humble and reverential. 
Those who have heard the truth and yet turn their nose up at it are foolish and ignorant. Those who have heard the truth and yet carelessly jump to conclusions or condemn it are beset by arrogance. No one who believes in Jesus is qualified to curse or condemn others. You should all be someone with sense and who accepts the truth. Lord, thank you that you graciously provide all my needs according to your riches and glory. Philippians 4.19 Thank you that I am worth more than many sparrows. Matthew 10.31 If you provide for the birds of the air, help me to trust that you will provide and meet the needs of me and my family. I submit my finances to you and ask you to help me manage my money wisely. Thank you that you created the heavens and the earth and everything in them. Both riches and honor come from you and you own everything. Help me to remember that everything I need comes from you. You are a gracious God, and you willingly give and provide all that I need. Amen. Security from yesterday. God requires an account of what is past. Ecclesiastes 3.15 At the end of the year, we turn with eagerness to all that God has for the future, and yet, Anxiety is apt to arise when we remember our yesterdays. Our present enjoyment of God's grace tends to be lessened by the memory of yesterday's sins and blunders. But God is the God of our yesterdays, and He allows the memory of them to turn the past into a ministry of spiritual growth for our future. God reminds us of the past to protect us from a very shallow security in the present security for tomorrow. The Lord will go before you. This is a gracious revelation that God will send His forces out where we have failed to do so. He will keep watch so that we will not be tripped up again by the same failures, as would undoubtedly happen if He were not our rear guard. And God's hand reaches back to the past, settling all the claims against our conscience. Security for today. You shall not go out with haste. As we go forth into the coming year, let it not be in the haste of impetuous, forgetful delight, nor with the quickness of impulsive thoughtlessness. But let us go out with the patient power of knowing that the God of Israel will go before us. Our yesterdays hold broken and irreversible things for us. It is true that we have lost opportunities that will never return, but God can transform this destructive anxiety into constructive thoughtfulness for the future. Let the past rest, but let it rest in the sweet embrace of Christ. Leave the broken, irreversible past in His hands and step out into the invincible future with Him. Have you ever said to yourself, I am impressed with the wonderful truths of God's Word, but He can't really expect me to live up to that and work all those details into my life. When it comes to confronting Jesus Christ on the basis of His quali ties and abilities, our attitudes reflect religious superiority. We think His ideals are lofty and they impress us, but we believe he is not in touch with reality that what he says cannot actually be done. Each of us thinks this about Jesus in one area of our life or another. These doubts or misgivings about Jesus begin as we consider questions that divert our focus away from God. While we talk of our dealings with him, others ask us, Where are you going to get enough money to live? How will you live and who will take care of you? Or our misgivings begin within ourselves when we tell Jesus that our circumstances are just a little too difficult for Him. We say, it's easy to say, trust in the Lord, but a person has to live. And besides, Jesus has nothing with which to draw water, no means to be able to give us these things. And beware of exhibiting religious deceit by saying, Oh, I have no misgivings about Jesus, only misgivings about myself. 
If we are honest, we will admit that we never have misgivings or doubts about ourselves, because we know exactly what we are capable or incapable of doing. But we do have misgivings about Jesus, and our pride is hurt even at the thought that He can do what we can't. My misgivings arise from the fact that I search within to find how He will do what He says. My doubts spring from the depths of my own inferiority. If I detect these misgivings in myself, I should bring them into the light and confess them open. Lie, Lord, I have had misgivings about you. I have not believed in your abilities, but only my own. And I have not believed in your almighty power apart from my finite understanding of it. If we lose the heavenly vision God has given us, we alone are responsible, not God. We lose the vision because of our own lack of spiritual growth. If we do not apply our beliefs about God to the issues of everyday life, the vision God has given us will never be fulfilled. The only way to be obedient to the heavenly vision is to give our utmost for His highest, our best for His glory. This can be accomplished only when we make a determination to continually remember God's vision. But the acid test is obedience to the vision in the details of our everyday life, 60 seconds out of every minute and 60 minutes out of every hour, not just during times of personal prayer or public meetings. Though it tarries, wait for it. Habakkuk 2.3 we cannot bring the vision to fulfillment through our own efforts, but must live under its inspiration until it fulfills itself. We try to be so practical that we forget the vision. At the very beginning, we saw the vision but did not wait for it. We rushed off to do our practical work, and once the vision was fulfilled, we could no longer even see it. Waiting for a vision that tarries is the true test of our faithfulness to God. It is at the risk of our own soul's welfare that we get caught up in practical busy work, only to miss the fulfillment of the vision. Watch for the storms of God. The only way God plants His saints is through the whirlwind of His storms. Will you be proven to be an empty pod with no seed inside? That will depend on whether or not you are actually living in the light of the vision you have seen. Let God send you out through His storm, and don't go until He does. If you select your own spot to be planted, you will prove yourself to be an unproductive, empty pod. However, if you allow God to plant you, you will bear much fruit. John 15.8 it is essential that we live and walk in the light of God's vision for us. 1 John 1.7 This event is a picture of the mistake we make in thinking that the ultimate God wants of us is the sacrifice of death. What God wants is the sacrifice through death which enables us to do what Jesus did, that is, sacrifice our lives, not, Lord, I am ready to go with you to death, Luke 22, 33. But I am willing to be identified with your death so that I may sacrifice my life to God. We seem to think that God wants us to give up things. God purified Abraham from this error, and the same process is at work in our lives. God never tells us to give up things just for the sake of giving them up, but He tells us to give them up for the sake of the only thing worth having, namely, life with Himself. It is a matter of loosening the bands that hold back our lives. Those bands are loosened immediately by identifica, tie-in with the death of Jesus. Then we enter into a relationship with God whereby we may sacrifice our lives to Him. It is of no value to God to give Him your life for death. He wants you to be a living sacrifice, to let Him have all your strengths that have been saved and sanctified through Jesus. Romans 12.1 This is what is acceptable to God. Now we believe, but Jesus asks, 
Do you? Indeed, the hour is coming that you will leave me alone. John 16, 31, 32. Many Christian workers have left Jesus Christ alone and yet tried to serve him out of a sense of duty or because they sense a need as a result of their own discernment. The reason for this is actually the absence of the resurrection life of Jesus. Our soul has gotten out of intimate contact with God by leaning on our own religious understanding. See Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. This is not deliberate sin and there is no punishment attached to it. But once a person realizes how he has hindered his understanding of Jesus Christ and caused uncertainties, sorrows, and difficulties for himself, it is with shame and remorse that he has to return. We need to rely on the resurrection life of Jesus on a much deeper level than we do now. We should get in the habit of continually seeking his counsel on everything, instead of macking our own common-sense decisions and then asking Him to bless them. He cannot bless them. It is not in His realm to do so, and those decisions are severed from reality. If we do some things simply out of a sense of duty, we are trying to live up to a standard that competes with Jesus Christ. We become a prideful, arrogant person, thinking we know what to do in every situation. We have put our sense of duty on the throne of our life instead of enthroning the resurrection life of Jesus. We are not told to walk in the light of our conscience or in the light of a sense of duty, but to walk in the light as He is in the light. Immerse John 1.7 When we do something out of a sense of duty, it is easy to explain the reasons for our actions to others. But when we do something out of obedience to the Lord, there can be no other explanation, just obedience. That is why a saint can be so easily ridiculed and misunderstood. Joab withstood the greatest test of his life, remaining absolutely loyal to David by not turning to follow after the fascinating and ambitious Absalom. Yet toward the end of his life he turned to follow after the weak and cowardly Adonijah. Always remain alert to the fact that where one person has turned back is exactly where anyone may be tempted to turn back. See 1 Corinthians 10, 11-13. You may have just Vic gone through a great crisis, but now be alert about the things that may appear to be the least likely to tempt you. Beware of thinking that the areas of your life where you have experienced victory in the past are now the least likely to cause you to stumble and fall. We are apt to say, It is not at all likely that having been through the greatest crisis of my life I would now turn back to the things of the world. Do not try to predict where the temptation will come. It is the least likely thing that is the real danger. It is in the aftermath of a great spiritual event that the least likely things begin to have an effect. They may not be forceful and dominant, but they are there. And if you are not careful to be forewarned, they will trip you. You have remained true to God under great and intense trials, now beware of the undercurrent. Do not be abnormally examining your inner self, looking forward with dread, but stay alert. Keep your memory sharp before God. Unguarded strength is actually a double weakness, because that is where the least likely temptations will be effective in sapping strength. The Bible characters stumbled over their strong points, never their weak ones. Kept by the power of God, that is the only safety. 1 Peter 1.5 That which does not kill you only makes you stronger. God never gives you more than you can bear. These are some worldly equivalents of the above scripture from 2 Corinthians. When I first read those verses, I certainly felt pressed, perplexed, persecuted, abandoned, and struck down. I wanted to wallow in those feelings. I was angry at God. I had a very bad case of 
Why me? Why not me? Throughout history, the strongest faith journeys have had seasons of pain and adversity. With Christ as our pinnacle example, we can say with confidence that it is impossible to be of great faith and not endure suffering. Hard times are inescapable. Now, how we react to hard times is indeed another matter. We can look away from God in anger and unbelief, and if we choose to remain this way, be crushed in despair, abandoned and destroyed. Or we can look to God and know beyond our understanding that He is at the core of our testing and that Jesus alone lights a path to the other side. You need to remember that even if you fail the first time, it does not mean you are a failure. In fact, it means that you were strong enough to try. You are strong. Keep putting your faith in me. I love you. Subscribe to our channel to help us reach 2,000 subscribers. Share this video to your loved ones. Donate us. Super thanks to support us. Type Amen to affirm. Thanks for watching.